All right, let's get started with some of the questions uh, from the Patreon, the patrons, Patreonies, whatever they, however they want to be known. Christopher says, I do believe that England playing Netherlands is ultimately a positive move, but does this series actually improve Dutch cricket apart from publicity and money? Does getting hit around the park for 498 actually benefit them playing wise, or is it just a myth? So a really interesting thing has happened in that in the two games. I've obviously been commentating them on talk sports. I've been watching them really quick, uh, closely. Arian Dutz, the tall uh, finger spinner, in the first game when they started hitting him, he didn't really know what to do. Uh, so the right-handers were hitting him, and he came around the wicket to the right-handers and started bowling outside of stump, bowling directly into people swinging arcs. Between that, he's clearly had a discussion with someone, the coaches have talked to him, whatever it may be. If you watch what he did in the second game to Jason Roy, when Jason Roy wanted to hit him, he came around the wicket again, bowled very tight. Jason Roy then tries to hit him in, almost inside out um, where there's no fielders, and he gets the wicket. Those are the sorts of things that are incredibly important. And you cannot, what's the best way of putting it? There's no way of getting around the fact that it's not that Aaron Dunn has never been hit before. It's that in other situations, he didn't have that level of intensity. He didn't have to go. Every, every cricketer has probably been, every cricketer, especially by his age, what's he, 18, 19, has probably been through plan A, plan B, plan C, right? When you're playing England, Jason Roy, Joss Butler, Liam Livingston, Phil Salt, even Dawood Milan. We're talking about you might be, plan A may not even make any sense. Plan B may work for like three balls. You have to be able to do that. What they got was a masterclass in what they have to do to stop players who are fairly unstoppable. Uh, then second game, I thought they did really, really well. I thought they bowled much better. In fact, had they not lost three wickets up the top in the second game, and then they not also had the um, uh, the collapse sort of to well not the collapse but when Scott Edwards got run out, I think they probably make an extra thirty or forty runs. England were struggling with their spinners. They started bowling really well. They tightened it. Um, Logan Van Beek is obviously a very good um, you know sa safe pair of hands when it comes to you know bowling seam towards the end of that game. England never had to worry about any of that, and probably even with the extra thirty and forty runs, they probably still win. But that's a huge turnaround between those two games. And a lot of it was little things that I thought a lot of the Dutch bowlers did a lot better. Like Shane Snater basically went, when it's not swinging, I'm just going to bowl cutters. Um, and, you know, Shane Snater is a good counter cricketer and he's coming through the game. But again, he needs that. He needs to play, you know, he's playing, he might play a game where he plays against one guy like that. Now he's got four, five, six, seven, eight players who can hit him out of the park at any stage. I mean, it was it Adil Rashid was batting at 10? David Willey at nine, maybe? I'm trying to remember the full lineup um, in one of those games, uh, maybe the 498 game. That level of batting, it's just so rare for you to ever have to come across it. And it w it's not a very strong Dutch team for many different reasons, but uh, I do believe that they would have learned a lot from that. Um, you know, it might, might have ruined some people's lives, but um, also, you know, for, for the players who can develop, I, I think that they... Um, uh, but for the players who are of that level um, and have the mindset of that level, I think that was a much better thing than um, not playing that game a uh, hundred times over. Uh, Will says, is it just me or does Amsterdam seem like a really fun place to watch cricket? Seemed like the fans during both the West Indies and England's matches were having a great time. I haven't been over, so I've just watched it on the TV the same as you. Um, I've always said this. I, I think the most fun crowds I've ever been in have sort of been associate cricket crowds for one day internationals or um you know you know i don't know i just something i find a bit boring about the ma the way the major fans or a bit tedious maybe is the better way of putting it the way the major fans sort of treat one day cricket these days whereas for netherlands that's a test match right um and it's a party it's it's like a test match and a t20 at the same time even if it's a one day so i think they do really get behind it it's obviously a very community uh you know netherlands scotland ireland namibia Papua New Guinea, all these places are very community like um, based. You know, you play a lot of the games in club uh, venues. A lot, you know, there aren't that many cricketers to pick from. I, I think Peter Boren said something on Talksport where he said um, it was one of the few times he'd ever been in a ground where there were a lot of Dutch supporters there that he didn't know. So that tells you, you know, generally he's at a Dutch game and he's like, yep, that's that guy. I've met that guy before and that guy always wants a selfie, that sort of thing. I think this summer has probably brought in new Dutch fans just because they've played so much cricket. And 
also, you know, um, have more cricket to come as well. Will, and then Will also says, should Owen Morgan retire before the T20 World Cup? I, I mean, I've, I've written so much about this. I do find the entire thing fascinating. We know that Owen Morgan goes in periods in his career where he doesn't score any runs and that everyone worries about him and then he comes out of it and you remember why Owen Morgan is so well regarded in the first place as a batter. But at his age, do you give him, how long do you give him the benefit of the doubt? I saw, I can't remember who it was. Someone said the other day, um, you know, he's won a World Cup, he should get as long as he wants. I'm like, if that was the case, Arjuna Ranatunga would still be running Sri Lanka. Like, that's that's not how these things work, right? Um, it's a really, really interesting one. I think their team's better without him at the moment. And so if that's the case, I probably have that conversation with him. But I'd certainly still take him out there. Um, and I'd be watching him very closely in the nets. And uh, I, I, I maybe what I... It's it's so tricky because you have to work out how you don't really want to lose him on the verge of a World Cup either, if that makes sense, um, because it's a huge destabilizing force. Um, I I don't think he should retire because that's his own choice. But I wonder if him and England, and I'm sure they are having very frank and brutal conversations, um, because I certainly would be if I was working with him. Nadika says, if a young Santos J. Saria was starting his career today in the current cricket landscape with his skill set, would he have a better career as an ODI player or as a T20 player? Oh, he'd certainly be a T20 player now. Um, I mean, if you, ha you have to go back, I'd have to have a look at his strike rate, but I would say it was on, you know, it wasn't like a Shahid Afridi strike rate, but it was certainly on the upper um, uh, parts of that. It's not like a standout strike rate. Um, I actually did something on Instagram. Uh, which is for a video coming up um, shortly where you can see that Joss Butler and Viv Richards are kind of the stand and, and Shahida Free are the standout strike rates. Um, but uh, uh, Jay Surya certainly would have been on the upper end of that. And I think if he played T20 cricket, that would probably be where his, his main school would be. To be fair to him, he was also a very good test player. Um, and, and, and so even if he came through now, I think he would be successful in all three formats um, again. Uh, Ian says the Netherlands schedule this summer playing West Indies, England, Pakistan, New Zealand will undoubtedly benefit the game there, um, improving the players and public interest. With the new structure looming after this World Cup cycle, how can we encourage the top nations to play associate nations more? So again, this is something I heard Peter Boren say, you know, this is the most important summer in Netherlands cricket history. And it also may never happen again because the world, uh, you know, uh, the league is leaving the one day league is leaving. Um, it's very, very possible that Netherlands never played this much international cricket again. It The only way to make it happen in, is to have it in a league and we're getting rid of the league. So without that, I really don't see how we're going to have a situation where these teams will get this much. But look at the amount of cricket Ireland Netherlands are playing this summer. It is, it's... It's exciting. Also, look, I don't know how the rest of you feel. Some some of you will like just major teams. But for me, it's just like it's another team to look at and learn about. Um, and in Netherlands' case, you're also seeing a bunch of young players developing. I mean, Bastelidi is potentially the best player that Dutch cricket has ever produced. Uh, he's 22. He can bat in the top four. He can, probably can bowl first change. Uh, good athlete as well. There's a lot to work out. His game's really, really raw. But, like, you look at him and he's like, he, he almost profiles more like a West Indian T20 player coming through the franchise system than he does a Dutch player. That's so exciting. Um, and, you know, he has to learn. And one way he has to learn is by playing good opposition and, um, and by not scoring 30, by scoring more than 30 runs uh, in an innings and by not, bowl, you know, and by bowling cross-seam deliveries into the pitch, not floats it up. He's a really exciting package. Um, I, I like the, the, uh, the spit out, uh, even Pringle when I saw him, Chris Pringle's son. I thought there, there was certainly something of him that um, in there. And Vikram G, you know, there's clearly talent in Dutch cricket, but these are young players that need to be developed. They can develop at a certain level by playing associate cricket. They're probably going to learn a lot quicker when they play as much cricket against the major nations as possible. I also think they dominated associate cricket for so long. They deserve to be playing against better teams. Aditya says, where would you rate border and war in the pantheon of Australian test batters? I think Bradman, Ponting, Steve Smith are at the top. Uh, would Border and War right along with Greg Chapel and Neil Harvey? I suppose it depends on whether you're looking at 
Well, one thing I would say is that in Moore's case, it's probably hampered by the fact he batted further down the order. Um, that created problems for the Australian team. Um, it's easier to find a number five batter or a number six batter, obviously, than it is a number, you know, three or four. So by him batting further down the order, I think that causes problems. Border, I think, mostly batted four and then obviously moved down uh, towards the end of his career, which is fine because he played a ridiculously long career. Um, uh, so a little bit different than, than what War did. I think Greg Chappell and Neil Harvey on pure batting talent have both of them. I think Border's longevity probably... I, I think well, having watched them both, I think Border was maybe a slightly better batter uh, than War. Although I don't think there's much in that at all. I think Greg Chappell probably just above them and Neil Harvey just above them as well. But I think you, you've got, what have you got there? Top seven. Um, I would find it hard to argue too, too much with, with the seven that you put together there. Um, and the order, yeah, is probably Bradman. For me, it's probably Bradman, Steve Smith, Ponting, Chapel Harvey, maybe, uh, Border War. Um, but yeah, I, I have to do a really deep dive to have a look at it. But off the top of my head, I reckon that's where I'm going with that one. I did here. Motorsport 101, um, Dre, which is Dre. I'm pretty sure it's Dre. <laughs> it says, I know you had a fascinating chat about state of commentary and broadcasting within cricket recently. So I was wondering, all time, what would be your ultimate eight person broadcaster panel for a test match? Oh, I like that. Eight person. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Um, A huge fan of an Australian broadcaster called Tim Lane, um, who's come back to cricket recently uh, and has been doing, I think, the 3AW feed. He, he, for me, was just a huge inspiration. Um, he's, I always thought he was the best cricket commentator I'd heard. Um, sadly, probably didn't do enough cricket commentary because of leaving the ABC. Um, so I probably would put him in. I would have... Um, I think I'd go with Richie Benno, just because it's Richie. Huge fan of Dan Norcross. Um, he's a friend of mine, so it's a bit icky, but I suppose I'm friends with lots of them now, so I don't have a choice. Um, but, yeah, you know, since, since the first moment I heard him on Test Match so far, I, I love the way he commentates on cricket. Uh, I love the ability that he has to weave in stories into cricket, into ball-by-ball -ball commentary. Uh, so I think uh, those those would certainly be right up there for me. Um, if it's my dream, I'd like to have Doris Burke, the NBA commentator, involved, just because I love her. And it'd be really interesting to see what she picks up in cricket than other people do. That's a bit of a weird one. Um, uh, you know, I probably can't say no to my mate Zoltzman of being the statistician slash whatever Zoltzman is on, on TMS. Um I love Neil Manthorpe, who I've been lucky enough to work with a lot. Uh, huge fan of Ian Bishop. Probably Tony Cozier as well, I suppose, would be another one that would, would um, come to mind. I don't know how many I have now. Oh, I love Ricky Ponting. Um, uh, when I was consulting with the ABC, I tried to get them to go after Ricky Ponting. They thought he would be too expensive. Um, so he's another one. Um, I'm trying to think of any of the sort of the older ones. Uh I've kind of always had a big thing for Ravi Shastri. Like, I don't know, maybe he'd be the host rather than the commentator. Um, but, you know, I've always been a, a big fan of, of what he does. Um, trying to think of some of the others. Yeah, it's, there's some really good, exciting commentators, I think, coming through at the moment. I've, I've said before, I think Simon Dool's uh, becoming a brilliant commentator. Um Always like Alan Wilkins as well, which is probably one that is not that popular, but something about his commentary that I've always enjoyed. Um, going back, I loved Roebuck and Harsha Bogle um, and Kerry O'Keefe, that old ABC team and Jim Maxwell as well. Um, so I've given you about 15 now. So uh, very sorry that I haven't been able to narrow it down. Also, you have to remember, like my, com my ideal commentary for TV and for radio would be completely different. My ideal commentary for T20 and for test matches would be completely different. There's a lot of things to think about here, Motorsport 101. Um, but thank you for the question. Uh, Ray says, what do you make of the ICC decision to reduce women's tests? Well, the ICC don't control women's tests. They've got nothing to do with it. I think it, uh, what you're referring to is Greg Barclay saying that, that 
they're not going to promote them or push them. Uh, it has nothing to do with the ICC, though. The ICC don't. The only test match the ICC has ever hosted, technically, is the World Test Championship final. And the only other ones you could suggest maybe they kind of were involved with were the, what was it, 1911 um, World Test Series or whatever it was called. Uh, what do I think of the ICC thinking that women's test cricket shouldn't be uh, pushed and promoted and loved and looked after? Well, I mean, that's idiocy. I think that there was a time where cricket had to make a call with women's, um, with the women's game. And at that stage, they had to make sure that women's cricket got bigger and they decided that T20 slash one day cricket was the best option. That time has passed. Women's cricket is now a lot bigger. It is a lot more sustainable. Uh, there is certainly, um, if you played a, if you played a women's test match in New Zealand at the moment, I think you'd be able to get good sponsorship call it Susie Bates's last game, whatever you need to do. I really do believe that um, there is a way to be able to do that. So I would, I, I think it's a mistake. I think it's short-sighted. And I think it made them look like idiots um, uh, as much as anything. Satchmo says, what financial model should Test Cricket adopt that would protect it from decline when T20 becomes more commercially dominant? Uh, you'd, you'd run a league and you would split it from all other forms uh, to the game. Uh, you know, uh, so instead of the ICC running all of cricket, you would have a, an organization, Test Cricket Org, <laughs> um, that looks after it. You might even have the same for a one day one, and you might have the same for T20. If you want, if you want all three of those formats to, well, T20 internationals in that to survive, um, that's what you would have to do. Uh, there's plenty of interest, there's plenty of money, there's plenty of streaming partners who would be happy to have it. It has to be run like a league. The playing costs and the player costs have to be paid out of the uh, rights package deal. Uh, and you could shore up cricket, for, uh, test cricket for the next 20 or 30 years, and it would make money. Um, the part of the reason it doesn't look like it's making money at the moment is because it's not being marketed correctly. It's not being sold correctly. It's being undervalued by the boards themselves. And then on top of all that, the boards are looking at something else the whole time going, oh, this is making more money. Have a look at some of the numbers uh, when it comes to streaming and watching on TV of test matches, how can you not make money off this? There are plenty of sports around the world not making anywhere near as much money. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, that are nowhere near as big as test match cricket that are making good money from similar um, viewership. There's certainly money to be made from test cricket. Sandeep says, uh, recently I read that most of the Bangladesh bowlers will be using the Duke's ball for the first time in their careers in test matches versus the West Indies. How difficult is it for bowls to adjust this change and why is that the case? So. Essentially, the ball feels different in your hand. So if you've ever played club cricket um, and you play in one competition or you play for, against one team and you play against another team, if it's a different ball, it feels differently. Uh, that affects, you know, the way it comes out. That affects what you can do with the ball. Uh, it affects your confidence, I suppose, as much as anything else. So certainly that is a big problem uh, with the ball. For seam bowlers, I would assume, and I'm not a seam bowler, having bowled seam with many different balls in my life, it's a small problem. I think for spinners, it's a much bigger problem. The way that, especially for finger spinners, um, a little bit for a spinners away, but the way that the ball fits, feels and fits in your fingers um, is really, really important. Uh, I also remember Ajahn Mendes coming up. I was interviewing Stuart Law years ago and when he was coach of Sri Lanka and Ajahn Mendes came up and said, you know, coach, sorry, but I just can't spin these Duke balls. And Stuart Law going, well, then you can go home. Uh, which was a bit harsh. That was very a very Stuart Law thing to say. But, you know, at a certain point, the bowler does have to work it out, right? Um, it's worth, you know, in those sorts of situations, uh, I don't know who the, who's the, is it Charles Langev out there bowling coach? I'm trying to remember who their bowling coach is. Um, uh, you know, in that kind of situation for Bangladesh, literally you, you just have to go very deep on your bowling coach. And it the seam is... And, and, and slightly the feel of the ball. Um, Dukes do feel slightly different to your hand um, uh, around the sides, but it's really the seam that is the main issue. The other thing is then what it does. So for instance, you really need to get in your head with the Dukes ball that it may not actually do as much as the Kookaburra for the first 10 to 15 overs, but that it will do more for longer. So you really do need to understand that and adjust it. So you may want to hold the ball back a little bit to start with, whereas with a kookaburra, you might want to bowl slightly fuller when it's swinging around everywhere. 
Uh, you also don't want to bowl two big opening spells because your second and third spells might be just as important with the Duke's ball. Whereas with a Kookaburra, you might want to bowl a very big spell early on and then have a bit of a puff and then bowl a short second spell, you know, uh, sometime um, later on. So all those things have to be done. Uh, they should have professionals around them that can help them with this. But at the end of the day, like, you know, the, f the feel thing is not something that you can really do. They should have been training with them beforehand. Um, that's what a lot of teams do now. I'm not sure if that was the case, but remember Kyle Jamieson turning up uh, in the IPL with a bunch of Duke's balls. Um, and, uh, you know, so certainly there is, uh, certainly some teams are thinking ahead. I don't I don't know what the Bangladesh situation is, actually, whether they've done that. Um, silly if you haven't, because they do feel different and it's something that you want to be able to deal with. All right, we've got some questions in the room. Oops. From Shramana. Who just went put mute on the minute I said her name. Shramana, are you there? You got mute? There we are. Are you there? What's your question? Oh. Oh, and she's gone. The question was not a question. Nikhil, are you there? Oh, we're having one of those days on Spotify Live, are we? Nikhil, are you there, mate? Yes, I am. Beautiful. What's your question? Hey, Jared. Uh, so I just wanted to know, uh, everyone's talking about England to be suddenly clear in test match ticket. But uh, I just don't, I mean, do you really think it's a sustainable way of playing? Uh, because the same set of players keep getting found out in conditions across, across the board. And so they had a one novel test match, which they won the first game. And the second game was a truly great performance. But it was a three, you know, it was a combination of flat pitch, uh, a real new flat pitch, a real tire bowling attack with a couple of key bowlers down. Uh, and you can't really slog your way to a 300 run target in 50 overs every time in the fourth inning. It was a great performance, but I just don't see what evidence are we seeing that this is a sustainable way of playing cricket because, uh, you know, am I just being cynical or what are your views? No? Uh, and the other question I have is, why can I not find the old cricket series on our podcast? Uh, the one which did with Gideon Gay and Ian O'Brien. They're there on Pick and Pull, but I just can't play them. I searched for a website at Pick and Pull, but you know, there's no player for that as well. The YouTube ones, uh, you know, just have a couple of them, you know, uh, the one way you talk about proper culture, etc. Uh, around, you know, the Mickey Arthur setting, but I just would love to have access to some of the old Wicked Series on our podcast. <laughs> I, I would love to have access to them too. I don't have them either, um, so I can't. I can't help you really? there. Yeah, um, e ESPN. Um, they've kind of mucked up podcasts. They didn't really understand what a podcast was back in those days, and um, yeah, I don't really know what's happened. I don't know how many episodes we did, for instance. Um, when people ask me how often it came out or anything like that, so uh, sadly I can't help you. Whatever you found online is probably what I'd be able to find online. I don't think I'd have the originals anymore. Um, I wouldn't even, wouldn't even know where to look at them. Um, I didn't dream about it. Uh, <laughs> I don't, as far as fearing England, I can't imagine. I mean, it was two fluky chases. And I don't mean fluky as in they were lucky to chase them because I think they played, you know, Joe Root certainly played brilliantly in the first one. And um, uh, at best, obviously, and Stokes played brilliantly in the second one. But I mean fluky in the, in the sense that it was the fifth and 11th biggest chases England have ever done. They came back to back and they won both of them. If de Grandhomme doesn't go off injured in the first game, the way he was bowling, there's every chance that at the very least he could have put a bit more pressure on, on Stokes. Um, obviously should have dismissed him once already. Uh, in the second game, way more so. The fact that they don't have Kyle Jameson is huge. If you look at the way that England played, there was still a lot of drop catches. Um, they've got a lot of players in the moment, at the moment, who are in form. But, to, you know... We're still not sure about their top three. Um, we know that Bairstow is probably not going to make consistent runs um, in his career. Looks like Stokes found a bit more form. I still don't think folks is probably, you know, is in their, uh, you know, their best seven batters. Um, so they'll probably, my guess is they'll probably move on from him. Um, the bowling still seems to have the same problems, Jared. 
Yeah, and so they still don't have a, they still don't really have a spinner that they trust. That might be changed by Moen Ali, of course. Um, but they still don't have a spinner that they trust. They're still not going to take a lot of wickets away from home. Uh, as you said, they tried the attacking method kind of twice. So if you look at Lords, it was just sort of Stokes on uh, Bearstow and Stokes on their on his on their own. Um, uh, you know, they went at those two guys went at it again in in the next match. Um, uh, it could have been what did Bearstow make in the in Lords? He made fourteen. Stokes was bold for what one off that no ball. Um, would they have played with the same gusto the second time? Would they have been able to do that with Kyle Jameson in the team? There's a lot of um, things that we can't answer. I've done a video on this. I don't think... It, sometimes when a team wins a couple of games in a row, it's just because a bunch of players are in form at the same time. It doesn't necessarily mean that the team is any better or worse than it was beforehand. And I think if you look at this particular case, they, they pick Pot to, you know, best case scenario, he's, he's like ninth or tenth on their depth chart. He comes in, takes a whole bunch of wickets in the first game, which helps him win that one. In the second Is game... Or it or it? Well, I think he's a better bowler. I mean, I think he's got a better test future than Overton if he wants to. He's a different kind of bowler. But but I don't think we're going to be sitting here in three years talking about how Matty Potts is one of the best bowlers in the world, right? I think, you know, we've seen his strengths and his weaknesses uh, to start this series. And um, I've got absolutely no problem with, uh, with them selecting him because... You know, he was in form at the right time and everyone else was injured. It makes sense. But when you do go throughout, you know, when you do go down their list, it's not particularly, um, uh, uh, you know, what is Potts going to be able to do for them overseas? Like if they had this attack of Anderson Broad, Potts um, and Leach overseas, you would think that they would win what, one in five tests. Um, and so all the, a lot of the same problems are still there for them. It, it would be my point. But... That's not to say that they haven't played brilliantly, because I think it's fair to say that you to do two chases like that back to back, very rarely has that ever happened in Test cricket. So you have to credit them for that. Thanks for your question, though, mate. Or questions? Oh, oh, she's back. Hello. Sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, so Australia is in Sri Lanka at the moment. When the mm -hmm. captain is asked in a press conference if he sees the series as a standalone series or a build-up to the test, he said, no, no, it's absolutely his own thing. It's own right. But then really, everyone is being managed, keeping in mind the test series, injuries, rest, ill games. England also don't have their full strength 11 in Netherlands right now. They don't mind, but still. Um, with the World Test Championship and Red Bell reset, the White Bulls captains are adjusting. But what a wonder since in Morgan wake up and say it, it may not be the pinnacle of cricket, blah, blah, but my team is important to me and I want to work hard on it and I have worked hard on it and I want some cause in my favor and they demand more. What happens? Civil war in there. Yeah, well, I don't know if you know, but I assume, you know, this has already happened obviously with England, but, but it was the test team that got very upset that the players kept getting rested for the World Cup. Um, and players said that they didn't want to be rested, that they actually wanted to play more cricket. And England had decided that players were going to be arrested, which meant if you have a look at the Sri Lankan uh, Indian tours that England played last year, I wouldn't say it was a civil war, but, you know, it was... Bairstow was certainly a player who was frustrated. I think Butler was frustrated. Moen Ali was frustrated. Um, so it's already starting to happen, but it's happening in kind of all directions um, based on the team. And so... Uh, from the first time we got to the point where teams started rotating and resting players, um, I think this was always going to be an issue. If you look at the Australians, they've done this for a long time. It's very rare for Australia to go into a game with a full-strength ODI or T20 team outside of a World Cup. Um, it's part of the reason that they kind of – no one really knows how good they're going to be at any World Cup because we don't really know how they play together as a team because it quite often comes together at the last minute. And – whether that is the best way of doing it or not is arguable. But the thing is that we play too much cricket and that we don't have a choice. And so in Australia, they decided to do it that way. In England, they started to do it in, in the other way. Um, you know, Rabada is someone who just is being massively overbowled by, in South Africa. You know, they're going to have to start looking at resting him. Um, I think there are some teams uh, where... Even the New Zealanders who don't play quite as much cricket as some of the other nations, I think they're starting to get to a point where it looks like if they want to get the most out of Trent Bolt and Tim Southey, they really have to start managing their workloads. Um, and 
and I'm assuming they do, that's going to cause problems going forward. So when you talk about the Civil War thing, when I was talking about that question before about, you know, what financial model should Test Cricket adopt, this is the problem, right? We have players playing quite often two and three different formats of the sport. In some ways they complement each other, but in other ways they compete. And now what directors of cricket and coaches and sometimes captains are having to manage is the fact that you can't have your frontline player available at all time. Um, Mitchell Stark is a perfect example of a bowler who just needs a lot more rest than other bowlers. And there will be bowlers who don't need as much rest. Um, and, uh, you know, England are doing everything they can to squeeze out the, you know, the last few wickets out of uh, Stuart Broad and Jimmy Anderson. They did that by basically taking them out of their white ball game. That ended up making their white ball team better. But if you look at Jimmy Anderson, he actually had quite a good record as a white ball bowler. Um, and I think Stuart Broad's got quite a good economy as a T20 bowler as well. But they did that. Uh, in order to get the most out of them as test players. We'll also see that in other directions as well, where, you know, um, sometimes it'll be players, sometimes it'll be the boards coming together and saying, we don't want this. But uh, yeah, whether it'll be a civil war or not, it's just going to be consistently uncomfortable going ahead that I wonder how often the absolute best 11 will be picked by a team from here for the next 10 years in any format outside of World Cups and World Test Championship finals. England are in a dire situation with the Red Rod team, so. Uh, but I mean, in Australia, they're doing well both ways. But so, but still, they're kind of giving some a uh, bit of a preference to Test cricket, which is, I think, in Australia, very common. Uh, that Test cricket is best cricket. So, uh, in that sense, what is like, I don't see that. So, all the SPJ my both series, I just see one day things just going berserk and coming and saying, "No, I want him," and then they're just battering players. I mean, when it comes down to it, no one gives a shit about bilateral one-day series. No one in cricket cares. Maybe about the captain of that so, team does. We, I don't do so. Even the cap, even the captain. What any captain who who's there, they're worried about their overall record, right? Which is which is a bigger concern. But it doesn't matter to them if they lose an individual series. Most of those captains will be told that they will be there for the next World Cup. If they were then to you know be told that they they're the position was under pressure, they will then go, well, wait a minute, you haven't given me the best team in a very long time. That's how it should work in a professional environment. It should, certainly should be working in Australia. Um, it should be like that in others, but not all environments are quite so professional with their conversations. Um, but Australia, it doesn't matter if Australia win any of these games. It matters that Australia is very strong in the next Champions Trophy and very strong in the next World Cup. That's what their one-day team should be building up towards. Well, uh, test cricket is completely different because we play test cricket um, for individual series and it's much more important if you win individual series than it is um, anything else. The World Test Championship might change that in test cricket. You might see teams starting to do that. But it doesn't really matter in what direction that you do it. Um, you know, that as I said, teams are already doing it in different ways right across the board. Um, some will, you know, if you're coming up to a World T20 final, uh, sorry, World T20 World Cup, and you've got a player who's, you know, scheduled to play four tests, a fast bowler is scheduled to play four tests, I can certainly see teams um, easing back on their, on their workload if they have to. Uh, there's too much cricket being played. Um, so what you're talking about is a natural stress and strain of that. I don't think the sort of people that you're talking about at the moment would care that much about it, but the next generation might, and, and people going ahead will. There's no doubt that Joe Root stayed on as captain in part after the Ashes because he felt that, he hadn't been a part of his poor record was because he hadn't been given the best team possible. So we're already seeing that happening. There, there, there's absolutely no doubt that that is happening. But at the same time, um, there's too much cricket being played, and we're asking the same people to play all three formats too often, or at least two of these formats too often. Uh, and these things are going to keep happening. But what you have to understand is that no, I don't think any longer teams are trying to win every game. And that is a big change in world cricket, which we haven't seen before. And what they're trying to do now is manage it so they win as many games as possible rather than trying to win each individual game in any format. Last bit would be who is making these decisions? Like who uh, decides who plays what game? Uh, so it depends. Every country is different. So you'll have, in some situations, you'll have the players will have a big say themselves. In some situations, the coaching staff will be the main uh, part of it. Uh, and then you have, in some countries, you have general managers slash director of cricket. So uh, they will be, you remember, you're thinking about individual games. 
you can't manage a cricket team and think about Australia has to beat Sri Lanka in this next game. You have to think about what are we doing for the next three years? You know, how, what has that guy done in his last 10 games? What has that woman done? What's her workload like? All those sorts of things have to be managed when you're thinking about a sporting team. Every sporting team in the world that is run correctly is thinking about these sorts of things because there are only so much you can get out of any athlete when they're at the top level. Remember, this is elite sport. So if you have a bowler who might be better than another bowler but is getting tired, you're better off to actually bring in um, someone else who is fresher um, who will be able to play in that situation for your long-term um, health. So, it, you know, it, it really does depend on the structure itself. There are certainly players who have asked for rests. There are certainly players who will say things like, I don't think that's an important tournament, a tour. I don't want to go on that. Um, more often than not, it's probably something to do with a coach or the director of cricket or their general manager, whoever that may be. But well, there's too much cricket. There's too many formats of cricket. And so this is a natural thing that is going to happen until we do have a split um, or one of the formats goes bust. Right. Thanks. No worries. Thanks for your question. And we have Ritaraj. Oops. Is it Ritaraj? Yeah, Ritaraj. Hey, uh, my question was regarding the, how much of a role, like home advantage and, you know, like, go, please, or, like, how tough is it to flee conditions that the players aren't familiar with and... How much does a board's lack of resources play into it? So, um, for example, uh, manager Jamar Dnei, right? Like, when you compare his away record in, like, mm. South Africa, England, New Zealand, or anywhere like that versus Rahul Dravid, right? How much of that is just down to the resources their boards have? Well, I don't think that's as much down to the resources their boards have. I think that's fundamentally that Sri Lankan pitches are probably the most... Uh, in Asia, they're, they're the most unified spin pitches that you get. Maybe Bangladesh might have beaten them of recent times, but I'm not even sure Bangladesh. I, I think that the Sri Lankan pitches spin more than anywhere else in the world. Uh, I think they're probably less helpful to seam bowling than most other conditions in the world. Um, and it's a bit like, so if you're a Sri Lankan player or an English player, you're probably at a massive disadvantage because the the difference between your pitches is so... Um, uh, minimal that you're not growing up on as many different surfaces. If you're in India, you will go on seeming pitches. You will go on pitches that bounce. You will have very flat batting pitches, you know, all sorts of different pitches that are slightly more variable than you get in Sri Lanka, partly because the country's bigger um, and partly because you have different kinds of climates, whereas Sri Lanka has a very similar climate everywhere. I think if you look at New Zealand and England, probably very similar again. South Africa you can, you know, the, the varying kinds of pitches in South Africa uh, uh, probably have play a far bigger role in helping players than, you know, the board having more money. I've always thought that was a big part of why West Indies did so well. Also, because the pitches are so different from island to island at times. Um, and even Australia, it, it, even though you, I, I suppose you never get used to lower bouncing pitches because there just aren't many of them in Australia, and certainly until the end of the match. Um, but you do get pitches that spin, you do get pitches that bounce, you do get pitches that seam and swing and all those sorts of things. If you come from a culture that has a bit more of a monoculture when it comes to pitches, then really then what you need is your cricket board to understand that. And, you know, I've said for a long time that England should have an academy in Sri Lanka uh, and Australia should have an academy in Sri Lanka and, you know, and India should have academies in South Africa and all these sorts of different things so that you can literally send your players over, you control them rather than the local board controlling them. Um, and you can have a bunch of different pitches available to you. Um, uh, I think it's a really important thing. And if, if I was developing players, that'd be one of the, the first things that I would look at. Thanks, John. No worries. Thanks for your question. Right. Drew, if you there? Yeah, hi. I'm audible. Yeah, what's your question? Yeah, hi. I uh, wanted to ask, I just saw the test squad, Australian test squad for this uh, Sri Lanka series, and I don't see Glenn Maxwell in it. Is it his personal choice to stay out of it? Or if not, then don't you think he would have added uh, value to the uh, in these conditions instead of probably maybe a green or someone head or someone? Uh, can I get you to mute your microphone? Yes, yeah, really love. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I think they've just moved on from him as a test player. I understand what you're saying. He's obviously 
uh, probably one of the better players of spin. So they, uh, you know, in that sort of situation. But if you think about head and green, you're talking about players who are, you know, in their twenties that they're trying to develop. They want head to, uh, sorry, they want green to be able to play everywhere because in this situation, green can play um, and and be the, you know, perhaps second, but probably third seamer. Uh, that's a huge advantage for them. Uh, in Maxwell's case, you're like, well, Maxwell can ball spin, but they're probably thinking that head can also give them that part-time spin option. Um, I'm not completely sold on head, but they see head as a similar, maybe not a similar kind of player, but a similar kind of destructive force to Maxwell, but a lot younger, potential captain, um, all those sorts of things uh, with him. So I would think all things considered, if you were saying what is the best possible team uh, to win in Sri Lanka, I could see how you could make an argument for Maxwell overhead. I think if you're thinking the bigger picture, um, it probably makes a lot more sense for them to send head out than Maxwell. Just another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think it would be a good idea for getting teams like Ireland or Afghanistan to play in the Ranji Trophy and, you know, just putting them, them in one group? Will, will it help them grow their high-risk cricket game because they hardly get any games? Yeah, so what Cricket Island will tell you is that they want to run their own league and they don't really necessarily want to be in something like Ranji. Obviously, I don't know how much you know, but Ireland have played in county cricket before. Ireland, Netherlands... Scotland, I think those are the ones. I'm trying to think if I'm missing anyone there. Uh, Denmark never had a team in it. So, yeah, so it must have been. Uh, they've all played um, at times in county cricket. It becomes a little bit tricky with the ECB because who pays for it and everything. It's certainly, um, uh, it's, certainly, it's certainly something that I have suggested a lot before. In Afghanistan's case, um, I could certainly see why it would it would work. I think that what you'll see in the future is the major teams will play first class games in their season outside of their native country, so they can help develop their players. There might be a way that, if that was the case, that you could you could send over a team of developing players to let's say you could send over a very good team of under twenty one players from India to play in the Irish first class league which would be a fairly cheap option for you if you're Indian cricket. You get really good conditions. The players are really well looked after out there. And then the same, and then you could then put a, sim, a similar kind of team uh, from Ireland into the Ranji Trophy. I just don't think cricket's set up like that, though. Um, uh, you, I think that while it were, it could work, I don't know how you would go through actually you know, making that work from a financial point of view, from a logistical point of view, and all those things. But, yeah, if you're asking... I think when it comes to first class cricket, the more varied your first class cricket and the better strength your first class cricket, the better your international team will be. Um, so there's no doubt that Afghanistan and Ireland could both benefit from those sorts of things. But it's not, it really does come down to logistics and money, I would have thought. Um, and so I can't see either of those things happening. But thanks for your question. Thanks. Thanks. William, you there? Hey, Jared, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. How are you? I'm good. Excuse the background noise, waiting for a bus. Um, <laughs> what do you, it's a bit of a niche question, what do you use to make your charts that you use in your articles and on your videos, and where do you get the underlying data? Just curious. Yeah, so the charts we use uh, Flourish, Data Wrapper, and Canva. So when people say, oh, you know, what, what software do you use to make the videos? And it's like, there's like about nine softwares I use to make the videos, uh, if we're being honest. Uh, but those are the three main ones, I think, for the charts and graphs. So Flourish and Canva now work together, I think. Um, although uh, that's more for my production team. I just make the charts now and let them do the fancy stuff. Um, and, then, uh, and then on Data Wrapper, we use that for some of the, uh, for some of the other things. Although I'm moving away from Data Wrapper more and more just because uh, I've been Flourish just, just has so many more options. Um, then the data is there itself, any chance you could stick the name of those two Flourish and in the chat, um, just so I can look them up afterwards? Uh, yeah, I can try. I don't. Uh, um, but yeah, and then um, uh, what was the uh, and the other part of your question was where you get the data. So you get the data. Um, the best place to go probably is Crick Sheets. No Crick Sheet. I always forget. Does it have an S on it? Damn it. Um, uh, 
and that that has a, a database that basically it's just a person who runs that just scrapes all the ball by ball database off Crick info um and that allows you to have sort of everything that you need to know um as far as international cricket and a fair bit of t20 cricket uh you know that will tell you um uh, i don't know what strike rate someone has on the second ball of an over if you if you can uh, put it through if you can code um uh, and that's probably the the, that, they're the main places I go. I still get a lot of stats gurus. Stats guru has a lot of good stuff, especially for international cricket and women's cricket. So I still sometimes go there. Um, but yeah, that's those are sort of the main places that I that I go for the for that sort of stuff. Brilliant. Do you code them? Do you use Python or R or anything like that to to create the bins, or you just use the apps you described? Uh, so I can't code. I tried to teach myself, but uh, I'm not very good with languages. And uh, apparently, you know, that also includes coding. So I've never, um, I just couldn't teach myself how to do it. I, I have partnerships on partnerships on partnerships when it comes to stats. Um, so I don't need to be able to do that. Although if I could code or I could hire someone who could code, I'd be able to do even more. Um, far more, you know, uh, I'd be able to find so much more um, information out there. But um uh, so I'm a bit hamstrung by that, but I think if you want to be an analyst or you want to learn about all that sort of stuff going ahead, I would certainly suggest that um, uh, I would certainly suggest that you um, should look at uh, coding. I mean, I don't think you need to be an expert coder, but having any sort of uh, ability to code is certainly uh, quite handy. Uh, let me just look if there's anyone else in the um, uh, chat. Um, uh, Sidoff says, which bowlers had the best peak? If you're talking test cricket, I th it's probably Sid Barnes or Waka Yunus. I think they're the two that probably had the best peak. Um, and I suppose it depends on what you define as a peak. But um, I think over, what, 30 test matches, say, um, I, I would have thought that those two players are the ones. Did Sid Barnes play that many? I'm trying to remember now. Um, but I think those two are the ones that definitely uh, that come to mind off the top of my head. I'm trying to think. It's, it's a bit hard with Murali and Hadley because they had such long um, peaks. Fazal Mahmood might be another one as well. Um, but, but yeah, uh, Waka Yunus is one of the ones that when you have a look at a certain period, he just took his wickets so quick um, for, what, maybe the first four or five years of his career and then obviously sort of, he became a very good test bowler, but he wasn't anything like he had been uh, before that. Uh, and then Siddharth says, what is this energy off the pitch that commentators and players have been talking about for pace bowling? So what they're really talking about is that when you bowl the ball into the pitch, depending on how you bowl it, it comes off in a different way. So some of this is backspin, we believe. Some of this is the height and strength of the bowler. Some of this is the way the, the bowler's wrist releases, uh, releases the ball. So there are some bowlers that when they hit the pitch, the ball comes off a little bit slower. And there are some bowlers when it hits the pitch, it comes off a little bit quicker. Now, I'm not saying it actually, it's just, we know they all come off at a certain pace and we know that we lose pace off the pitch. But if you look at, there are certain bowlers that when the ball I mean, I always remember Shane Bond. Shane Bond was someone who was very, very fast, but when the ball hit the pitch, it seemed to, from watching it visually, lose pace. Whereas if you're looking at maybe someone like Mark Wood, you watch him visually and it feels like he's gaining pace. Now, that's neither of those two things are really happening. What it means is that when Shane, Shane Bond hit the pitch so hard that perhaps the ball got stuck in the surface a little bit longer and Mark Wood's balls perhaps kiss off the surface a little bit more it's to do with arm angles uh, height backspin probably wrist position uh, how much you cock your wrist how much flex you get in your elbow uh, i think all those sorts of things so there are bowlers that certainly get different it feels different to a standard bowler so um, i'm trying to think of someone uh, of a flint off for instance you know when they talk about the heavy ball um with his balls what generally happened was he uh, we think he just got extra bounce. And so the ball would generally hit the bat a little bit higher, which made it feel like it was heavier. And then there are other bowlers who seem to get the ball into the surface a little bit more, which takes pace off, which means that it doesn't, you're almost through your shot, even though they're really quick, you're almost through your shot 
at the wrong timing for it. And then the exact same thing with a very fast bowler who kisses the surface. Um, and, and so uh, if you look at Brett, is Brett Lee a good example? Um, if you look at someone like Jason Gillespie, who bowl really, really full um, compared to maybe other bowlers or, or fuller than a lot of other bowlers of his era, players who faced him said it felt like the ball came through quicker than it did when you faced Glenn McGraw. And yet they were both roughly the same height, but they had very different kinds of actions, uh, very different kinds of release, obviously very different kinds of speeds. Um, and so uh, you do get players like that who sort of uh, release, release it a little bit differently. Uh, but that's me. Thank you. Some great questions there today uh, from the Patreon people. Um, but also from everyone in the chat as well. Uh, I had to go a little bit early this week because I'm commentating the Dutch West Indies game tomorrow. Um, and then I'll be doing some work on the test, uh, England, New Zealand test match for the rest of the week as well. Um, it, you know, during the English summer, especially when I have more commentary gigs, uh, and, you know, I have to fit these things anywhere I can. So, you know, follow us on social media, on Twitter or Instagram. We usually put them up there. Or if you're a Patreon, we also usually um, tell people that they're up on Patreon or they're going to be coming up on Patreon or on the Discord. Um, there are many places to follow me if you feel the need to do so. Anyway, bye for now. I'll talk to you next time.